Good evening, everyone. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord. Amen. I don't know about you, but I definitely needed a time of worship. Thank Mike and the team bringing us into that wonderful place where we just uh, just before the Lord and just singing, you know, even when our bad voices and just thanking God for this day. So important to come together in the midweek. So glad you guys are here. Let's turn to Esther. <clears throat> Esther chapter 5. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We'll lend you one. If you don't have one, keep it because this is the Word of God. Amen? Amen. 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 And we believe this is God's Word and we teach it the way it was written. Book by book and chapter by chapter and verse by verse. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not hard. I mean, Chuck, he didn't come up with that. It was just, well, well, this is the way we'll do it. All right, let's do it that way. Father, we thank you so much, God, for allowing us to open the book. The Holy Spirit, Spirit breathed out book, Lord. And we ask that you speak to us tonight as we look to Esther's story. And that we ask that you bring application, God. Let us go home with something tonight, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last time we were together, we uh, looked at how this decree, this, which was issued to destroy all the Jews in the providence of the province of Persia, finally got out, and Mordecai, as other Jews, were hearing about it and was just broken. I mean, just devastated of what was to take place in 11 months. Mordecai, Queen Esther's uncle then, challenged the queen to go in and speak to the king on behalf of her people for at that time, no one knew that she was a Jew. The queen reminded him, or her, I should say, that no one goes before, or the queen reminded him, I'm sorry, that no one goes before the king without being invited. And if you did that, it could cost you your life. Well, look at chapter 4, verse 13. Chapter 4, verse 13. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from, for the Jews from another place. He believed that. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows, and here is this famous verse, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for what? Such a time as this. Such a time as this. And then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night and day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, what? I perish. And if I perish, I perish. Now picking up in chapter 5, verse 1, now it happened, and it always does happen, doesn't it? On the third day, this is that third day, Esther has been thinking, Esther has been pondering, Esther has been fasting herself for three days. It says that Esther put out on her royal robes, she got all gus gussied up, and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house while the king sat on his royal throne, not the toilet, this is a true royal throne, in the royal house, facing the entrance 
of the house. And you could not, the Bible tells us that, that Hadassah was so beautiful, very beautiful. So he, he could not miss her, her beauty and of course her, the way she, she was there in the royal robes. And so it was when the king saw Queen Esther, verse 2, standing in the court, that she found favor in his sight. Thank God. And the king held out to Esther the golden what? The scepter, which was the king's mercy, which was the king's grace. If he held that out to you, you know you found grace and mercy in the king. You were accepted. I'm so glad the Lord accepts all those who call upon his precious name. I'm so glad that we, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, will never be uh, rejected, who comes sincerely to God, humbly, confessing him as Lord. And, and yet at this time, this is the way they lived, and he did hold out the, the scepter, and, and which was in his hand. So... Here we see the king's mercy. And here we see that she has shown mercy and grace in the king's eyes. And, and I'm just blown away of the power of prayer. You see, when she told her uncle, go have the people pray, that also included, or, or, or fast, that also included prayer. But why even have to go through all of this? Because guys, sometimes in doing the work of the Lord, Sometimes in ministry, we have to do hard things. Those three days, I'm not even sure if she even slept. But in those three days, nobody else knew in that royal court, other than her, her own gals there, what she was going through, what she was thinking upon, what she was praying for. Esther didn't know how this would come about. But what she did know, that many Jews, including her small staff of slaves, were fasting and praying for her. And I believe that encouraged her to put on those garments, that encouraged her to get up on that third day, to put on those garments and to go take a step out in faith. Oh, the power of prayer, amen? It is powerful. It reminds me of Acts chapter 12. If you turn there to Acts chapter 12, this morning driving in, I was thinking of this, the power of prayer. And in Acts chapter 12, we find where Peter was uh, kept in prison, verse 5. Are you there? Say amen. Amen. Notice it says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but what? Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Amen? By the church. The church should see the priority of prayer, man. We should see that. I like the fact that I know we're all praying people. And I know that we pray before a, a series or a teaching, a, a Bible study, or a, before we go and do a work for the Lord, but we also want to set aside a Wednesday night to just pray, have communion, worship, seek the Lord. It's powerful, man. And so here, this is the, what the church is doing. They're praying for, uh, for Peter because he was in prison he was, uh, there it says, and when Herod was about to bring him out, verse 6, that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. It was an impossibility for Peter to get out, for Peter to get away from this. And why was Herod about to bring him out? To kill him. He had a death sentence. Sleeping between two guards. But behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. 
Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. And so he went out and followed him and did not know what was, uh, that what was done by the angel was real. He thought he was just dreaming. You ever have those dreams? It's like, it's, you know, it just feels like it's so real. But he thought he was seeing a vision. And he was used to visions, wasn't he? He was used to having visions. God was giving him visions. Verse 10, and when they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people, which was death. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. I like that name. I don't know why. Where many were gathered together, what? Praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda... Not the gal from the, from the old sitcom, Mary's. Well, it was Mary's house, too. Rhoda Mark. Yeah, there, look at that. Came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran and announced that the Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. You're nuts. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it's his angel. Or maybe some of you have, it's his ghost. But Peter continued knocking. I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. I love this man. And go on, you can read it later on tonight. But the power of prayer, and sometimes we're praying for things, and we're praying for people, and we, we see the miracle happen. We see a healing happen. We see our prayer becoming answered, and yet we, we get so overwhelmed with it or o- overcome by it, we don't really believe that it's actually happened. And this was the case here for Peter, the power, guys, of prayer. And so back to Esther. She didn't know what was going to take place, but she knew that there was people praying for her, people fasting for her. So important for us to intercede with one another, especially if we know that one is going through many many trials or going before something that is very heavy. Well, verse 4 of Esther, it goes on to say, So Esther answered, If it pleases the king, let the king and who? Haman. Remember that? Boo. Come today to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly, that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman went to the banquet that Esther had prepared. At the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, what is your petition? It shall be granted you. What is your request up, up to half the kingdom? That was a, a saying. Up to half the kingdom, it's yours. It shall be done. What do you want? Verse 7, then Esther answered and said, My petition and request is this. If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, Then let the king and Haman come to the banquet which I prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said. Now, maybe the king smirked at that a little bit. Tomorrow? (laughs) Maybe he rolled his eyes. This queen, you know. But he loved her and granted her that request tomorrow in 24 hours. She says, I will do as the king has said. She will give her request. She may have been a little intimidated, intimidated. Again, not not knowing exactly how this thing was going to work out. But the king was okay with it either way. I look at it as an ordained gap. It was a time period, another 24 hours for 
for the prayer to continue and for Esther to gain more confidence, but really it's for God to continue to work behind the scenes in this episode of events. In verse 9, so Haman went out that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and that he did not stand or tremble before him. Remember, Mordecai is not going to bow to Haman. He's just not going to do it. Even even with this decree now established and known, he's not going to bow to Haman. So Haman is joyful. He's glad that he's been invited again to another banquet. But yet, there at the gate is Mordecai. He did not stand or tremble before him. And he, Haman, was filled, it says, with indignation against Mordecai. One Jew out of all this royalty, all, all, all these people there in, the, in that city. It's just this one Jew, man. It always gets under my skin. But it's interesting that when evil has its way, it's joyful. But when evil is resisted, it's hateful and full of revenge. Nevertheless, verse 10, Haman restrained himself, and he went home, and he sent and called for his friends and his wife Zeresh. Then Haman told them of his great riches and the multitude of children everything in which the king had promoted him and, and how he had advanced him and how the king had advanced him above the officials and, and servants of the king. It says, and moreover, Haman said, besides, uh, Queen Esther invited no one but me to come and the king to the banquet that she prepared. And tomorrow, I'm again invited by her along with the king. Just boasting, man. Haman is, is having what we call an old-fashioned bragamony. Brings all these friends around, you know, he, so he can talk about his favorite subject. Self. Myself. Pride puffs up and loves titles and boasts of entitlements. And we see this just right here in these few verses. Pride looks for promotion for the wrong reasons. But love gains without thought of gratitude or humility. Or, or, or they, love, they love to gain, I should say, without thought of gratitude or humility. Interesting, when you read and study Verse 13, as he's bragging, as he's boasting, as he's telling them how good he is, he says, yet all this avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate. Well, then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Well, let gallows be made 50 cubits high. That's 75 to 80 feet tall. And in the morning, suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it. You're in good with the king. You've got all these entitlements and, you know, rubbing shoulders and being invited to banquets. Just do this. Go on, do it. Just tell the king in the morning. Hang him. Then go merrily, you see, because evil evil rejoices in doing that which is wrong. Evil rejoices in murder, rejoices in killing, whether it's with the tongue or actual, in this case, murder, hanging. Then go merrily with the king to the banquet. (laughs) And the thing pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. We see here through his wife who should be giving him good counsel. If nothing else, just ignore that guy. Don't worry about that guy. The edict's out. Everyone's going to be 
killed at this point. You know, why, why are you worried about this? No, she gives him evil counsel and an evil plan, along with the rest of them. You know, it's interesting, Zeresh's name means gold. And we know that gold is a valuable gem, even today. But in her counsel to Haman, it was really foolish and wicked, so we could say she became fool's gold, which will lead to her husband's downfall. Because if you read it, the rest, you see at the end, she kind of turned on him. And that's what fool's gold does. It looks like gold in our hands. Tastes like, or no, it feels like gold in our teeth. And you go to the jeweler and says, that's not worth nothing, man. Evil begets evil. And its desire is to kill those who stand in its way. It defies what is good and holy. We're just seeing this played out here. Chapter 6. Sleepless in Shushan. Verse 1. That night, the king could not sleep. I mean, this whole story of Esther saving the extermination of the Jews lays upon the king's insomnia. You ever see it that way? Homeboy can't sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the Chronicles. They're written historical data of daily activities or events that went on, you know. You know and, and, he, and, and they were read before the king, you know. Uh, it's just like many of us, when we can't sleep, we'll, we'll, we'll get, grab a book, maybe, and start reading. You know, War and Peace, that'll put you out. Um, or, or, or turn the TV on, you know, something to lull us asleep, right? But if you notice, sometimes it's God who's keeping us up, or it's God who wakes us up. It's God who puts a, someone on our heart or something on our heart to pray, to ponder over. That God, that God is, is dealing with us in a time where everything is quiet and we're, we're at a resting place and he says, hey, I want to talk with you. Let's have some words, man. I haven't talked to you all day. What's up? What's going on, man? I find that true. Especially if I dream of, I don't know about you guys, if I dream of someone, I say, why did I dream of that person? I said, Lord, maybe you want me to start praying for that person. I don't know. It's not going to hurt, right? Maybe it was that chili Rieno I ate that last night or something. But if, here it is, so let's pray. I mean, the king could have requested a hot bath. That's those, that'll put you out, right? Or somebody suggested warm milk. I don't know about you. Don't be giving me no warm milk, man. Remember those pet, old pet cans of milk? Ugh. My grandma. Grandma used to stay with us. Back, I guess it was early 60s. I was four years old. She used to make milk out of that. Terrible. Or what it would be to help him sleep, but he requests the chronicles to be read. Was that just something that came to his mind? Was it some, you know, coincidence? I don't think so. These chronicles were records that the king should have read or have been informed of before, but they're probably so boring, he didn't want anything to do with it during his daily duties. You know, you read it, and if there's anything important, let me know. But the reader just happened to choose an event to read that took place over five years ago. Verse 2, and it was found written that Mordecai had told Big Thana, he's big, and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on the king of Hazard. Just so happened that they turned, right, to that. This event is recorded in Esther chapter 2 and verse 21. It says, in those days while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's units, those two guys, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. 
So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on the gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles, in the presence of the king. And so this just so happens to be what he picks up and starts to read to the king. Well, the king asks questions. In verse 3 of chapter 6, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? On this night, this same night that Haman is having gallows built to kill Mordecai, the king is planning on how to honor him. Isn't that interesting? Two different scenes going on. Has he, have we, what have we done for him? I mean, he saved his life. He saved, he stopped an assassination plot. I love it, man. And the king's servants who attended him said nothing has been done for him. Nothing had been done to reward him. And as we've seen, the king is all about rewarding, especially when someone saves my life. So verse 4, the king said, well, who is in the court? I, I, I labeled this in the wrong place at the right time, you know. Remember that song? Forget about it, man. Who's in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. So he's going following through his wife's council and the friend's council, and they built the gallows, man. That was quick, wasn't it? Anyway, now he's in the court, and I'm going to go. Maybe I can catch the king before he passes out or sleeps. And the king's servant said to him, Haman is there, standing in the court. Just so happened to, right? And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king asked him, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, here's his heart, right? Whom would the king delight to honor more than Me, my favorite subject, me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity, me. You know, someone said pride, pride is also the only disease, or pride is the only disease known to man that makes everyone sick except the one who has it. I know you heard that before. It's like bad breath. Everybody knows you have it, except you yourself, you know. I remember listening to Pastor Poncho give uh, his testimony. God bless him. I love that guy. I, I learned so much from him. And he was saying, he, you know, he came to the altar, you know, to get saved, man. And some dude with bad breath was, do you want to get saved? He goes, yeah, man, yeah. I accept Christ, man. Stop breathing on me, Holmes. In verse 7, and Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn. Look, notice this. Now he's thinking of, it's me, bro. And a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. It's almost as if he's dreamed this before and is, you know, he's just imagined this, you know. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of the one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights in honor. And he's probably just, you know, kind of deal. He's picturing himself on that horse having people proclaim that he is the honored man, that he is the honored one that the king delights in. I got another one for you. Pride is the carbon monoxide of sin. It silently and slowly kills you without you even knowing it. And here he is just breathing in this, this pride of 
carbon monoxide and seeing himself just being paraded and someone dressing him, you know. You can't, you, the Bible's interesting, man. I love it. And as I was studying that, I came across a pastor's, uh, I guess we could say, uh, his test. And it was interesting for us to take to see if we have signs of this disease called, disease called pride. And I'm going to share it with you because I, I had to read it. So, <laughs> number one, do I like to talk more about me than others? Well, that's a give me, right? Number two, do I dominate the conversations to talk about my issues and stuff? Number three, am I more aware of others' faults than mine? Number four, do I find more pleasure in pleasing myself than others? Number five, am I more concerned about controlling others? Number, yeah, it's guilt, uh, yeah. Number six, do I enjoy thinking of myself more highly than others? Um, number seven, do I get excited when others fail? Number eight, do I get angry when I don't get my way or get what I think I deserve? Number nine, am I driven to achieve for recognition's sake? Number 10, do I need someone to prop me up, tell me how great I am, and never tell me any negative feedback? Thank you, dear. <laughs> and number 11, do I find it hard to admit that I'm wrong? William Barclay said this, pride is the ground in which all other sins grow and the parent from which all other sins come. We gotta be careful with pride, guys. And doesn't it look ugly on others? It looks so ugly on others, and how ugly this is as we read it. You know, because we know the rest of the story, right? If you haven't, hold on, man, it's gonna just trip you out. But when we read that, we said, does this guy see it? Doesn't he see? No, they don't, they're blind. Because it's all about them. Well, verse 10, it says, Then the king said to Haman, Hurry. Yes. Take the robe. Yes, yes. And the horse, as you have suggested. Yes, king. And do so for Mordecai. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. You know, it's like, he's just a stiff, you know. Do so for Mordecai of the Jew who sits within the king's gate. Yes, yes, I know where he's at. And leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. You know, there's those saying, what comes around what? What goes around. Now, that's not biblical, right? Nor is karma. You know, you go to the hood and you ask the gang members, do you believe in karma? Oh, yeah, man, I do. Gang member says, yeah, I, I could be next. I could be next. But we say in the Bible, whatever a person, what, sows, he's going to what? Reap. This is what we're seeing played out here, guys. So Haman took the robe and the horse. Yeah. <laughs> he's going to be a slave to Mordecai. And he arrayed Mordecai. And he, can you imagine him dressing him? And, and it, it could even include bathing and preparing him and, you know, being there and, and led him on horseback. <laughs> through the city square and proclaimed before him. <clears throat> Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights in honor. You know, sinful. <laughs> My sin is I wanted to be there to see that guy's face. You know, God forgive me. <laughs> to be there to see him go through this. But this is just a wow. This is a trip, man. This is what happens. Afterward, verse 12, Mordecai went back to the king's gate. 
But Haman hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered, shamed, embarrassed. Now he's, look who's mourning now. You know, but he, it's, he's, not, he's not broken though, man. That would, you know, you know the old, the old uh, I told you this about in Florida, there was a, a, a pastor's conference and before it got started, the, the, the lead pastor said, we're going to need a chairman for the, uh, for the conference. Uh, and one of the pastors who I knew said, well, you know, chairman, I, you know, I'm a senior pastor, I have elders, I, I can chair a, a board. We need a chairman, everybody's, oh, Pastor Schmackatelli, yeah. Make sure all the chairs are put up after, after the conference and make sure they're put, uh, uh, the janitors will tell you how, to, how they want it. And he was like, hmm. Now that was a face to behold. But anyway, that's how God deals with us, doesn't he? He deals with us that way, man. I, I, again, uh, a Montebello uh, story. Uh, Dorothy and I are driving in, and I'm guest speaking at, at the Ark Montebello with, for Poncho. And I drive up, and there's a, a guard. And now, their guard, you know, if you go to East LA, the people that are getting saved are gang members. And they're tatted out, and they're big, like they just got out of prison, right? And here's this old veterano, veteran. And, and he's, he's there, he's a parking guy. I pull up, hello, I'm the guest speaker. He goes, and? Uh, where's, do I have a special parking space or anything? Uh, yeah, back there, see that parking space? All the way in the back 40, go park your car. You know, basically, he told me. And I shared that with the con- con- uh, congregation. He has a way of humbling us, doesn't he? You mean I don't have one up here? It has my name on it? Yeah. Get back there, man. We ain't got time to play your games. I mean, his ego here, man, has been, been dealt with something. And, and it's hard. So let's, let's wrap this up. Let me see. Yeah, let's wrap this up. Verse 13. So when Haman went, and he, and he, he told his wife, Jeresh, and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife, Jerez, said to him, this is interesting, a whole turning of events. If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. Well, wait a minute, what kind of support is that? See, that's what Satan does. See, Satan lures you and lures you into an area. It could be pride. It could be a, 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 a sin. It, it could be, but he'll lure you, and you'll think, this is going to be great. This is going to be awesome. You know, uh, this is, and then down. He leaves you in the dumps like he left Judas. Judas thought these 30 pieces of silver, you know, which is really nothing, and he thought that he, this was going to satisfy him. And, and you know, he's God, uh, I guess. You know, Jesus can get out of this. Uh, but he didn't realize he played the part of the betrayer. And he ran, and he ran where? He ran back to the temple where he thought he could find help. Thought it, that he would find grace. Thought where he'd find mercy. And they wanted nothing to do with him. That's blood money, bro. We don't want nothing to do with you. And that's the way Satan works. He puffs us up. He, he builds us up. And then for what? For a huge fall. Well, I thought this was going to be what I always wanted. And now that I have it, it's been nothing but a curse and pain. The one who previously suggested that Haman build the gallows, his wife and his friends, knowing the edict issued against the Jews and hearing that Mordecai was honored by the king who issued that decree, somehow, somehow knew that the Jews were always going to be safe from the law written against them. How do they know? I don't know, but somehow they realized, wow, if the king honored Mordecai, basically, you're done, dude. 
It reminds me of Gamaliel. Is that how you say his name? And uh, remember that? It reminds me of his statement after Peter and, and the other apostle says, you know, that, you know what? We can't help but preaching the gospel. We, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. We can't help but doing what God had called us to do, and they wanted to kill them, remember? Just wipe them out. And this is what he said, and now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work of, is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Wise words, huh? But they, they didn't embrace it, did they? They didn't believe it. They didn't follow through with it. But it was wise words. And it's, it's almost Zeresh has this insight and these friends saying, oh, you're going to fall before him. You're done, honey. That's my wife. You're supposed to support me. You're supposed to encourage me. You, you, you're the one who said to build the gallows. You're done, Holmes. Verse 14, and while they were still talking, the team can come up, and while they were still talking with him, the king units came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther has prepared. Now, I don't think there's too much joy in his heart. He doesn't know what's going to happen next. What's going to take place? What do they mean that I'm going to fall before him? What are you saying? Well, Read ahead for next time. We have a family meeting, I believe, next Wednesday. So read ahead. You have plenty of time to finish the book. And we'll see what happens in the next episode of Esther and Haman and Mordecai. Father, thank you, God, for this time you've given to us in your word. And Lord, help us, God. Help us to be humble Lord, help us to be broken before you, God. Help us, Lord God, just to to sow humility and grace and mercy, God. That what will grow out of that, Lord, is, is what you require of us. To walk humbly with you, God, to to love mercy. <laughs> Just the fruit, Lord God, of the Spirit to to worship you and to praise you, Lord God. Help us as the church to do that, God. We've got to be the difference in what's out there. The backstabbing and the, the lying and the cheating. Lord, watch over us this week. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen.